Good evening, St. Rest. How blessed of God we are to share in Bible study tonight. We will continue in Nehemiah. Tonight we will look in Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 10 through 14. Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 10 through 14. I want to talk about keep your integrity. Keep your integrity. From Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 10 through 14. Let's pray. We'll read the scripture and then see what God has to say to us tonight. God, our Father, we honor you and bless you for all that you are and all that you do. We thank you for this privilege to study your word. We thank you for what you're teaching us in your word, God. Uh, these have been great lessons that are important to us, God, and we thank you that you have led us to partake in these lessons as we study your word. As we continue in this series, God, I would ask that you would show us those things you'd have us to see. Speak those things you'd have us to hear. Teach us what you'd have us to learn so we can be who you've called us to be. More importantly, do what you've called us to do. Even now, Lord, sit Michael down. Allow them to see and hear Jesus, not me. Let your word go forth with both accuracy and clarity that your people be edified and you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Again, for our time together tonight, we will look at Nehemiah chapter 6. Verses 10 through 14 from the English Standard Version, it reads, Now, when I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mehitabel, who was confined to his home, he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. And they are coming to kill you by night. But I said, should such, should, should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in. And I understood and saw that God had not sent them, but he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this purpose, he was hired that I should be afraid and act in this way in sin and so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, O oh my God, according to the things that they did, and also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. As we continue in this part of Nehemiah, we learned last week that Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, and the Arabs tried to discourage the workers from finishing the work. Uh, they tried to get Nehemiah to meet with them and pull them away from the project. They were trying to meet in the plane of Ono, and he told them flat out, I'm doing a great work. I can't come down and meet with you. And he continually told them this as they were trying to meet with him. And he told them the rumors that you're, you're setting, you're making them up in your own mind. He continued to stay on the wall. And now in these verses, this is an attempt not just to discourage the work, but to discredit Nehemiah and his integrity. Uh, this is the second portion of the attack we see in Nehemiah chapter six. The first part, again, they are attacking the work, but now they're trying to attack the leader. Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem have constantly tried to stop this nation from rebuilding the wall. They've tried to stop Nehemiah from leading them. And this latest tactic involves some tricky tactics because now they're getting prophets and church involved in the business. As you read verses 10 through 14, they hired a prophet to tell Nehemiah to come to the temple because they're going to kill him by night. And Nehemiah understands this was not a moment or a call to worship. This was a tactic that would discredit his name because he was not supposed to be in the temple since he was not a priest. It lets us know that we need to be careful how we respond to the requests of others. Because again, some folks will cry wolf just to see you howl. Mm -hmm. They will put you in position, set you up and trap you so you can discredit your own name. And they will taunt you and blame you publicly because you made a mistake privately. So really this lesson teaches us you can beat intimidation with integrity. That's the lesson I want us to learn tonight. You can beat intimidation with integrity. Now, this is not integrity to self. This is a personal commitment to the word and the will of God. 
when you know what God has said, when you know what God is doing and you know what God has called you to do, you can avoid traps of intimidation when people try to set you up to fail because you're maintaining your integrity in the word of God. There's one thing that needs to be kept in these days is your integrity because people will try to attack your name and character to where you'll be blamed and blamed endlessly because of one mistake that you made. Don't allow others to intimidate you to make mistakes that go against what God has called you to do. Keep your integrity and avoid those traps of intimidation and you can beat intimidation when you have and keep your integrity. So the question is, what does it mean to keep your integrity? These verses show us two things we need to do and what it means to keep your integrity. First of all, be aware, be aware. Let's look at verses 10 through 13 of Nehemiah chapter six. Now, when I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mehetabel, who was confined to his home, he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple for they are coming to kill you. They're coming to kill you by night. But I said, should such a man as I run away and what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in. And I understood and saw that God had not sent them, but he had pronounced his prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin, and so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. So Nehemiah goes to the prophet's house and he hears the prophet's advice. The prophet tells him to go to the temple, go to church and stay inside the temple because they're going to kill you by night. Other translations will say they're going to kill you tonight. He's encouraging him to go to this quote unquote safe haven, go to the temple so they can he can avoid dying by their murderous hands. But notice Nehemiah's response. He asks two questions. Why should I run and why should I enter the temple and expect to live? Now, the second question about the temple is not Nehemiah rejecting the idea of going to church or going to the temple to worship. He understood his role. Nehemiah was a cupbearer. He was not a priest. And for him to go into that portion of the temple was an automatic disobedient sign against God. And it would cost him his life. When you read Numbers chapter 18 around verse seven, it outlines the priestly duties. The Bible says that anyone that was outside of the priestly ranks who were caught inside the temple was disobedient to God and it would cost them their life. Nehemiah understood his role. It wasn't his place to be in the temple with the priests. He was supposed to be on the wall, leading the people, rebuilding the wall. So once he realizes what's happening, he breaks down this plot that's happened. He realizes this prophet was not sent by God. It was sent by Sanballat and Tobiah. Sanballat and Tobiah hired the prophet to intimidate him to sin and have a bad reputation. It teaches us, first of all, be careful with who gives you advice. You have to be careful with who gives you advice, because even inside the church, church folks can give you bad advice. Even inside of places where you trust them or they're around your circles, those individuals can be guilty of giving you bad advice. Everything that is religious is not right. Everything that is churchy is not Christian. Everything that is good is not godly. And the Bible teaches us throughout that there are some people, as Paul told Timothy, who have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. That's why John tells us over in first John, don't believe every spirit, but try the spirit to see that they are of God. And the way we try the spirit is not by the spirit. The way we try the spirit is by the word of God. If someone gives you advice that does not align with what God has said from what God has already said, do not take that advice. They can wear a three piece suit. 
they can sing all the hymns, but if the advice they give you does not come from the word of God, you do not need to take that advice. They can have on the longest skirt. They can be the one most wonderful person. But if their advice does not align with the word of God, you do not have to and should not take that advice. Be careful with who gives you advice. But the second lesson that we learn from this part of the passage is this. Trust God's word more than you trust good advice. Trust God's word more than you trust good advice. Because as we look at this passage, the prophet can be deemed a good person because they're a prophet. They, they are a spokesman of God. Going to the temple can be the right place. But good advice can come from the right person in the right place and still not have the right motive. Because as we learn from this text, the prophet didn't tell Nehemiah go to, to go to the temple for worship. He didn't tell him to go to the temple for safety. He was trying to set him up to ruin his good name. And you have to be careful when you get advice from the right people in the right place, but it's not the right motive. Make sure, again, the advice you receive lines up with the word of God. And if it does not line up with the word of God, you need to trust God's word more than you trust good advice. Because at the end of the day, you have to give an account to God, not to those people who gave you that advice. You are held responsible for how you react and obey the word of God more than how you react or listen to good advice. So trust God's word more than you trust good advice. And that's so true with where we are today, because many times people have so many things to say about what happens in our lives. People will tell you how to spend your money. People will tell you how to conduct your marriage. They'll tell you how to be a good worker on the job, how to handle your business. But at the end of the day, if they're not giving you advice that lines up with the word of God, you need to trust God's word more than good advice. Because some people tell you how to handle your marriage, that you should put your spouse on a silent treatment and do other things to get what you want. But that doesn't line up with the word of God. God's word tells us how to conduct ourselves in our marriages. And you need to follow and adhere those principles when it comes to your marriage. Same thing with finances. People will tell you that you should cut corners and take care of your bills and don't give God his 10 percent in tithes and offering. But the word of God tells us that if you give to God, God will make sure that he will take care of you in the process. So whatever it is, whatever advice you receive, if it does not line up with the word of God, be strong enough and aware enough to trust God's word more than good advice, because you have to give an account to God more than you'll have to give account to those who advise you. So you need to be aware. You must be aware. Second, if you're going to keep your integrity, this lesson teaches us that you need to be prayerful. You need to be prayerful. Let's look at verse number 14. The Bible says, remember Tobiah and Sanballat, oh my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. Now notice in this part of the passage, mm -hmm. Nehemiah has every right to seek revenge. He has this prophet who tries to set him up. Sanballat and Tobiah have been on his case since chapter two, and they're trying to ruin his good name. So by human nature, he has all the rights and privileges to seek revenge. But instead of seeking revenge, he seeks to pray. And that's important for us to remember as we're keeping our integrity that some battles are not meant for you to fight that the best battle you can fight when it comes to those enemies who try to ruin your good name is to leave them in the hands of God. Fight that will that says fight back and follow what the word of God says. Don't render evil for evil, but trust God with your enemies because the Bible says vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And when God says he will repay, he'll get your enemies back far better than you can. So instead of being vengeful and seeking revenge, we should seek to pray. Now, notice what Sanballat prays. He does not pray, God, get them back. He does not pray, God, strike them down. He makes this simple request. God, remember Tobiah and Sanballat. Remember them according to what they did. And also remember those who tried to make me afraid 
and not carry out your word. Now, the question is, why does he use this word remember? When you look at this word remember in the original language, it means to recall. It's the same word used in Genesis chapter 8, verse 1, when God remembered Noah and the animals in the ark as they were just floating on water after 40 days and 40 nights of rain. So the Bible says when God remembered Noah, he sent this great wind to cause the water to go away. And this is why it's important for us to let God handle our enemies and, and those who try to intimidate you. You don't have to fight them because God reacts to what he remembers. The reason why you need to be prayerful and pray like Nehemiah does is because God reacts to what he remembers. And that, that line offers us both a warning and a comfort. You need to stay on the good side of God's memory because if you are on the good side of God's memory, God will remember you according to what you have done for him and then he will react accordingly. But the danger is if God does not remember you, he will still react accordingly. That's why the Bible says in Matthew and in the Gospels where Jesus is talking to some people and they he says to them that many will say at the end that, you know, we've prophesied in my name, you've cast out devils in my name, you've done all these great things in my name. And then the Lord will say, I never knew you depart from me. What a tragedy it will be if you're not on the good side of God's memory that when it's all said and done because of bad motives, bad ideas, and because of a bad, selfish heart, God looks you in the face and says, I never knew you. That's why it's important for us to be on the good side of God's memory because God reacts to what he remembers. Even when it comes to our sin, God will still react in judgment. That's why he says in the book of Revelation that those who are liars, stealers, cheaters, and whoremongers, those who have not confessed their sin before God, they will experience their life in the lake of fire, which is the second death. God reacts to what he remembers. But if God remembers you well, if you do what God has called you to do, he will still react accordingly. And we see this played out in Luke chapter 23 with the thief on the cross. As Jesus is hanging there dying for our sins, there's one thief that asks him, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And immediately, based off that request, Jesus responds by saying, today you will be with me in paradise. That's why you want to be on the good side of God's memory, because God reacts to what he remembers. And if you're faithful and integral in what God has called you to do, God will remember you according to what you've done for him. And he will remember your enemies according to what they've done to you. And he will react accordingly. So again, it's important for us to be on the good side of God's memory because God reacts to what he remembers. So while we sing the hymn, will the Lord remember me when I am called to go? When I have reached death's chilly sea, will he his love there show? Oh, yes, he heard my feeble cry from bondage set me free. And when I reach the pearly gates, he will remember me. God, our father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for reminding us to keep our integrity. Thank you for showing us that we can beat intimidation by staying and keeping our integrity. So God, help us be aware of the advice that some give us. And help us to check that advice according to your word and help us to trust your word more than we trust good advice. Help us to be prayerful, God, that we don't take revenge on those who try to ruin our name. But instead, we seek you and trust you that you will remember and react to what you remember. So, God, I pray that this word blesses those that it needs to bless, that it encourages those that need encouragement, that it convicts those that need conviction. Don't allow this word to fall on rocky soil, pricked hearts and pricked minds, that this word is planted as a seed of faith and blossoms and accomplishes what you please. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We thank God for your presence tonight. We pray something was said in this lesson that can bless you along your journey. If you've been blessed by this lesson or blessed by the ministry of St. Rest, we will encourage you to give as God lays on your heart to do so. Here at St. Rest, we have several methods by which you can give. You can give 
Uh, physically, we have a drop box available on campus where you can drop off contributions. You can also give electronically through Givelify, PayPal, Cash App, and Google Pay. Several methods of giving, but the same mentality. God loves a cheerful giver, and you cannot beat God giving no matter how hard you try because the more you give, the more God will give to you. So if you feel led to give, we encourage you to do so. And please know that we will be good stewards of what God has blessed us through your contributions. As we're closing tonight, there are no major prayer requests that we have. Continue to pray for our church family as a whole. Let's definitely be in prayer for those who have been impacted by Hurricane Ida. Uh, this was a tragic storm that impacted our Gulf Coast around Louisiana and Mississippi. Others are still dealing with it, and it will be months before people can even begin to recover and get back to their lives. Uh, it's bad enough that we've dealt with a pandemic. It's bad enough that we've seen tragedy overseas. Now group that with this hurricane. It's been some difficult times. So please be in prayer for those who, are been, who have been impacted by this storm. Uh, and let's pray that God blesses us to offer help to those who have been impacted. And as always, we encourage you to let us know how we can pray with you. We believe in the power of prayer here at St. Rest, not because we're so eloquent in our prayer, but simply because God is able. We believe as his children, he'll hear us. And as our God, he'll answer us. God, our Father, as we close tonight, we say thank you for this privilege of prayer. Thank you for those who are watching, those who have heard your word tonight. God, I pray for the storm victims of Hurricane Ida. You've seen the tragedy that has taken place. You've seen the shattered buildings, the destroyed homes, the souls who have been evacuated to several parts of the region. You know the hearts that are concerned about how they're going to rebuild and how they're going to uh, progress from this time of tragedy. I pray, God, that you would have mercy on them. Pray, God, that you would be to them what they need you to be, a comfort, a help, a way maker and a provider. I pray for those helping hands who are helping with the recovery project. God, continue to strengthen their hands for the work. Give them energy, resources, and wisdom to be a blessing to those who have suffered loss because of this storm. And God, I pray for those who are watching tonight, those who have special prayer needs. You know what's on their hearts and minds. I pray, God, that you would specialize those things that seem impossible. I pray that you would do what no other power can do. When it's all said and done, when you've done what only you can do, give us a heart of gratitude that says thank you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, the only name that matters. Amen.